1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. I want to hone in on tonight the power of living a grateful life. We all want to know what God's will is in our lives, right? And it's different for different people. But there is God's will for all of our lives that's spoken about in the Bible. And one of it is right here. It is to be thankful in everything. Give thanks. And I want to talk about that power of being that appreciative person. How being a grateful, thankful person changes everything. You see, I believe that the degree that you're thankful is a sure sign of your spiritual health. I mean, how thankful are you to God? How thankful are you to others? I believe that the greater thankfulness that you walk in is an expression of your spiritual health. It just naturally comes out of you. You could tell when Gus was sharing up here, he's grateful to the Lord for what he's done in his life. I mean, he can't even introduce somebody without preaching right in the middle of it. (laughs) Telling about how good God is. That just overflows an appreciative spirit right out of his heart. The degree that you're thankful is a sure indicator of your spiritual health. And appreciative words are one of the most powerful forces for good in the earth. I like to say it this way. Do you count your blessings or do you think your blessings don't count? A person is wise when he doesn't long for the things that he doesn't have, but rather is thankful for the things that he does have. And see, I want to talk about this tonight because I want to position you this weekend, and and other people will position you about different things, but having a grateful heart, an appreciative spirit, a thankful way of life changes everything. Many years ago, there was a lady who got a phone call uh, from her babysitter uh, telling her her daughter was really sick, and she needed to come home right away because her daughter had a fever, so she uh, dashed out of work and started heading home and decided she'd stop off at the pharmacy uh, to get some medicine for her daughter, and uh, she was in a rush, and uh, she went into there, got the medicine, came back out to her car, and realized she'd locked her keys in the car. Well, she had to get home to her sick daughter, right? And she didn't know what to do, so she found a way to call home and talk to the babysitter, and the babysitter told her that her daughter was even getting worse and that she needed to get home right away. And in fact, the babysitter said this, hey, maybe, maybe you can find a coat hanger and use that to unlock your car. Somehow, I've heard people do that, you know, use that to get into your car. And, uh, and so... The lady hung up, and she didn't know what to do, and wouldn't you know it, she walked back to her car, and laying there on the ground next to her car was an old rusty coat hanger, as if somebody else had been there before, locked their keys in there. So she got kind of excited, and she picked it up, and then she realized, I don't have a clue what to do with this. So she did the only thing she knew to do. She bowed her head and asked God for help. And within a matter of a couple of minutes, a car comes driving up right, right towards her and pulls in right next to her spot in the parking lot. And it's driven by a very scary dude. And she thought, maybe, maybe this person's here to help me, but man, I don't know. He's pretty scary. But again, she was desperate and she was thankful that somebody was there. So she got out. Uh, got out, uh, he got out of his car, rather, and she went over to him, and she went up to him and said, uh, Sir, my daughter's really sick. I got some medicine. I got to get home right away, and I locked my keys in my car, but here's a coat hanger. Do you know how to do anything with this? And the man said, Sure. No problem. He took the coat hanger from her, went over to his car, went over to her car, and within a matter of moments, boom, the car door was unlocked. 
And she went over to him and she hugged him. And she said, thank you so much. You're such a nice man. And he said, lady, I ain't such a nice guy. I just got out of prison for car theft. (laughs) And she hugged him again really fast. And she looked up towards heaven and said, thank you, God, for sending me a professional. (laughs) You see, I think the only prayer, the only prayer you say your whole life is thank you. That would probably be enough. Thank you. I mean, right now this weekend, just think about all that we have to be thankful for. I have a word for you today that I believe will be an encouragement to you. You know, uh, forever uh, people used to come up to me and they would say, are you a pastor? Are you a prophet? Or Are you an apostle? Are you an evangelist? Are you a teacher? And I never, I thought, I don't know. I don't feel like I'm really any of those. But then I saw a little bit later on in the Bible, they talked about encouragers. And so today, I know that that's what God's called me to do. And I want you to receive an encouraging word today. All right? I have a title for my message here today. And the title is this, Fear Not Tomorrow. God is already there. Fear not tomorrow. Why? God is already there. And he's working on your behalf. And he's doing things already in your future. I want to read as we begin from the book of Luke chapter 12. Starting at verse 22, Jesus said this to his disciples, For this reason I say to you, do not worry about your life as to what you will eat, nor your body as to what you'll put on, for life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have no storeroom or barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable you are than those birds. And which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your lifespan? If then you cannot even do even a very little thing, why do you worry about all these other matters? It says, he said, consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, but I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was clothed, he clothed himself. He was not even clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today, and then tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you, you men and women? Of little faith. And do not seek what you'll eat or drink, and do not keep worrying. For all these things the nations of the world right now eagerly seek. But your Father knows that you need these things. But seek his kingdom, and all these things will be added to you. He's telling us, Fear not. Tomorrow. He's already there. There was a great evangelist years ago uh, named Billy Sunday. And Billy Sunday said this. He said that fear knocked, knocked at my door. Faith answered. And there was no one there. You see, that's the proper response to fear when it tries to show up on our doorstep. And I want to let you know this morning, this good news, that fear is a poor chisel to carve out your tomorrow. And the good news is, if you're looking at your future from a position of fear and worry, the good news is your view is wrong. Your view is distorted. 
that view is inactor, inaccurate. You know, fear and worry, here's what it tries to do. It, 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 it's like interest paid in advance on something you're never going to own. How many of you would pay interest on a car you know you'd never drive? You wouldn't do that. Would you pay interest on a house? You know you'd never move into. But isn't that the way that fear and worry tries to steal from us in our lives? You know, the Swedish have an old proverb that I think says it quite well. The Swedes say this. Worry gives a small thing a big shadow. And there's no question that when we allow fear and worry to come into our lives, you know what it does? It never stays the way it came in, if we give place to it. It never stays like a little small worry. It goes and when it comes in, it wants to grow and grow and grow and create this huge shadow that affects every area of our life. Worry gives a small thing a big shadow shadow. Now, I want to tell you a story. I know I've told this story years ago here, but it's so applicable, I, I want to tell it again. And here's the story, because I think it makes a powerful point. Years ago, I had finished my day at the office. I'd got up from my desk. I began to walk out of the office building. And as I began to walk, I noticed that I had a bump on my knee. And this bump was so big that it actually made my pants stick out right here on the inside of my right knee. And I saw that bump, and instantly this thought came to me. You, you didn't bump your knee on anything today. And I began to replay my whole day, convincing myself that I'd not bump my knee on anything. You know what? You should never build a case against yourself. (laughs) It's been said, don't put water in your own boat. The storm will put put enough in on its own. And like Pastor Blunt says, stay out of your own way. And did you know Dwight L. Moody said this, I've never met a man who gave me as much trouble as myself. And I began to replay my day, convincing myself I'd not bump my knee on anything. And as I did that, I began to touch this bump, knowing I hadn't bumped my knee on anything. And a second thought came to me. You've had bumps before. This feels different. This doesn't feel like a bump. It feels like a lump. (laughs) And I'm touching it. I I didn't bump my knee on anything. This feels different. And within five minutes of thinking like this, I now began to picture myself playing golf with only one leg. (laughs) You see, through fear and worry, I had gone from a bump to a lump to a stump. Now, I don't know if you do this or not, but by now I'm driving home. And all of a sudden I realized what I was doing. And I went, time out. You're so stupid. You know, there's something powerful about stopping. Saying, time out. Stop. I'm going to get the right perspective. I went, time out, John. You're so stupid. I thank you that by Jesus' stripes I was healed. I thank you that the Bible says that the believers can lay hands on the sick and that they recovered. And I put my hand on my knee and I said a prayer. And by the time I was home, that bump was completely gone. But I'd allowed a small thing to become a big shadow. You see, everything God wants for you in your life is right on the other side of your fears. Uh, In in case you don't know, 
there's four phases of life. Four phases of life. Phase number one, you believe in Santa Claus. Then phase two, you don't believe in Santa Claus. Phase three, you are Santa Claus. (laughs) And phase four, you look like Santa Claus. Just trying to be helpful here. Tonight, I want to share with you three ideas, three things that you want to try? Okay, just keep moving. There's three things that every one of us has to deal with in our life. And and there's three decisions that we make in these three areas that really impact us probably every single day. Are we all right? Okay, that's good. I don't know if we'll make all that much difference, but I, I'm a little more comfortable with it. <laughs> yeah, I can move my hands now. That's right. Will we choose fear? Who will be our friends? And will we decide to forgive? And those are the three areas I especially feel in my heart to share with you about tonight. Kind of practical stuff. Who will we forgive? Who's going to be our closest friends? And will we choose fear over faith? I like to, frankly, talk about fear when I'm full of a room, uh, when I'm in a, in a room full of people that believe and that are, uh, that are full of faith. Now, that may, sing, may, may sound kind of odd that you want to talk about fear in front of people that have faith. But what we realize is this, that fear and faith are a lot alike. They both believe that what you cannot see will come to pass. And that's why fear likes to jump in and take the place of faith in our lives. And we really have a very distinct choice between living a faith-filled life or a fear-filled life. You see, I like to say it this way. Fear and worry are like interest paid in advance on something you're not going to own. How many of you would pay interest on a car you know you'd never drive? Would you pay interest in advance on a house you know you'd never move into? Of course you wouldn't. But isn't that the way that fear tries to steal and rob from us? It tries to act like that, like interest paid in advance on something you're never going to own. And tonight, if you're viewing your future from a position of fear, here's the good news. What you fear is not correct. What you are afraid of is not accurate. It's distorted. It's out of line. I promise you this. It's not right. And notice that when we begin to worry, it never stays small. If we allow it to come into our life, we allow it to take root in our lives, fear, it doesn't stay that size. It wants to grow and grow and create this huge shadow that over-dominates our whole life, wants to influence every area of our life. The Bible says that we should cast down, have nothing to do with vain imaginations, those things that proclaim themselves as higher than God. That's what fear tries to do. And that's why as soon as you get it, you should cast it down. Get rid of it. Don't give it a chance to take root. See, worry is this. It's the misuse of God's creative imagination that he's given to every one of us. It's the misuse. I mean, think about how amazingly creative we are. You don't think you're creative? Look at yourself. Listen to yourself when you're full of fear. We're so creative. It's the misuse of it. And then when we do that, we wonder, why don't we get any ideas? Why don't we get any insight? Why don't we get any kind of revelation? Because we're misusing it over here in the area of fear and worry. You see, I believe that when fear comes, we should actually expect the opposite. Faith to rise up inside of us. You know, really, in many ways, the Bible was written to teach us to expect the opposite of what we see in the natural. Fear comes, let's faith come. Lack tries to come into your life, believe for God to provide for you. Sickness tries to come into you, believe the opposite for God to heal you and raise you up and strengthen you. 
Expect the opposite. That's what the Bible says in 2 Timothy 1, 7. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, right? But the opposite, it says he's given us power, love, and a sound mind. He's not given you a spirit of fear. The word worry itself, it comes from an Anglo-Saxon word that simply means to choke or to strangle. And it's no doubt that it paralyzes us. You know, overanalysis leads to paralysis. That's why you got to give it to God. You got to cast it down. 